this is the limbo that we've all gotten used to in Zoom, where we just wait for the technology to come up, catch up to us in this thing. Is it letting you in, Lindsay? Oh, I'm playing it? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I asked you. I, that's OK. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, that's on me. OK, Never yeah. Mind. Mind. Sorry, I thought you were on uh, school Wi-Fi, Ryan. I am not, unfortunately. OK, my mistake. I didn't realize you guys were waiting for that, me. That's OK. I think we should see it now. I'm sorry. Yep. Good morning and welcome. My name is Victoria Ordaneta, and today I will be presenting to you a thesis presentation on the topic of community development for displaced people. Thank you all, faculty, staff, and guest jurors for being here today and dedicating your valuable time towards this presentation. Before I begin, I would like to start by thanking my thesis advisor, Professor Juan Berg, for all his help and support. I would also like to thank Professor Brian Kelly, not only for his help with my thesis project, but for his support during my entire graduate career. I will be forever grateful. And lastly, but most importantly, I would like to thank my family. Without their love and support, I would not be here today. Before I begin, I would also like to dedicate this thesis presentation to Professor Carr of the Puig. His guidance, help, and advice were crucial in the completion of this project. While I would have loved for him to see it, I hope that wherever he is, I make him proud. As a Venezuelan, I believe it is my responsibility to share the ongoing problems the country is currently facing. For that reason, I decided to select Good morning and welcome. My name is Victoria Ordaneta and today I will be presenting to you a thesis presentation on the topic of community development for displaced people. Thank you all, faculty, staff, and guest jurors for being here today and dedicating your valuable time towards this presentation. Before I begin, I would like to start by thanking my thesis advisor, Professor Juan Burke, for all his help and support. I would also like to thank Professor Brian Kelly, not only for his help with my thesis project, but for his support during my entire graduate career. I will be forever grateful. Lastly, but most importantly, I would like to thank my family. Without their love and support, I would not be here today. Before I get started, I would also like to dedicate this thesis presentation to Professor Carl Dupuy. His guidance, help, and advice were crucial for the completion of this project. While I would have loved for him to see it, I hope that wherever he is, I make him proud. All right. As a Venezuelan, I believe it is my responsibility to share the ongoing problems the country is currently facing. For that reason, I decided to propose this thesis, Seeking Home, a community development for the Venezuelan diaspora in Quito, Ecuador, with the hopes of inspiring others and proposing alternatives to some of the challenges faced by the Venezuelan community around the world. I will be going over four main points today. The bill context, the social context, the site, Ecuador, and finally, the community development itself, La Union. The bill context, refugee housing around the world. To give you an idea of how important the situation is worldwide, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, there are around 70.8 million people displaced around the world. The first and often main challenge faced by displaced people are the difficulties of finding a permanent place to live. Immigrants, refugees, and all displaced people are often associated with the idea of temporary housing, with countries offering them housing through refugee camps, which are a temporary solution and face many problems. 
like being far away from city hubs. So my sound froze on, on my end. Did everybody else get that? Yeah, Brian, I think you need to unmute yeah. for the sound to, to flow through. Oh, one more time, Brian. Sorry. And I think Victoria's frozen also. I, he might have paused. Oh, oh, okay. She's going. So I think if Brian unmutes, we can rewind a few minutes or like a minute or so and then pick it back up. Okay. Great. Very housing stigma associated with immigrants, regardless of their situation, and offer them a permanent place they get to call home. The social context, the diaspora. More than 5 million Venezuelans have left the country, most of them between 2015 and 2020, as a result of the political, social, and economic problems that have been going on for the last 20 years and which only get worse with time. Out of these 5 million, 4 million Venezuelans have moved to South America. Colombia being the country with the most Venezuelan immigrants, already over 2 million. Ecuador, Peru, and Chile come in second, with around half a million each country. While visiting Ecuador earlier this year, I had the opportunity of interviewing and hearing the stories of a few Venezuelan immigrants, like Franklin, who had his own farm in Venezuela and not worked as a watchman of a ranch. He spent weeks sleeping on the streets until he was able to rent a room with his brother, or Yusmari, who walked from Venezuela to Colombia and then used public transportation to arrive to Ecuador. She had to save for over two years to be able to bring her daughters with her. Horacio, Victor, Vanesca, and Fran lived together in a small apartment, but before they slept on the streets for months. They currently sell fruits on the streets of Quito. Samuel had to drop out of college to find a better life with his girlfriend, with whom he currently lives along two other friends. He currently sells cleaning products on the streets, but dreams on going back to school one day. Like these stories, heartbreaking, are the millions of other stories from the diaspora. Ecuador, a case study. While the idea of this thesis is to propose a project that can be easily replicated around South America, I decided to select Ecuador as the site. But why Ecuador? Well, it is one of the countries in South America with the smallest population, only 17 million, yet just as impacted as others by massive migration from Venezuela. Being a developing country, it also has a high poverty rate and therefore offers less opportunities than countries like Colombia or Chile, which are a little more developed. Its architecture is fascinating. Colonial architecture can be seen around the historic center of its biggest cities, like Quito. Due to the many volcanoes and frequent earthquakes in the country, most of its buildings are low density. And due to its prestigious location, being by the equator, most buildings are single loaded to take advantage of aspects like cross ventilation. I tried to use these observations as inspiration for this thesis proposal. La Unión, a community development. This thesis not only focuses on offering the diaspora a permanent place to live, but also a place that allows them to connect with the community and where they can find job opportunities on site. Since there are around half a million Venezuelans in Ecuador, determining the right size of the project was a challenge. These families are usually composed of four to five people, meaning 
in order to help at least 1% of the population, around 5,000 people, 1,250 apartment homes would be needed. 50% of Venezuelans in Ecuador are located just in Quito. For this reason, the site of this project is in Quito, Ecuador's capital. Quito is the second highest capital in the world, being at 2,850 meters above sea level. Its altitude and proximity to the equator allow the city to have great weather all year round, between 9 and 19 degrees Celsius. It is specifically proposed in the southern area of the city, in the zonal administration of Kitome, which is around 20 kilometers from downtown Quito. This is a residential area, but is also known as a transportation hub, since so many public transportation services transit through the site. Most importantly, it houses the largest bus terminal in the city, Terminal Terrestre Quitumbe. As previously mentioned, it is a very easily accessible site for public transportation. Additionally to the bus terminal, a metro stop of the city's new metro was just finished in the area. Kitumbe also offers a variety of services, including several public parks. This is what the existing conditions look like. As you can see, there are a few small houses scattered throughout the site. However, the site is surrounded by big apartment complexes like the one proposed in this thesis. That way, the proposal can blend in with the surrounding area. The site is also surrounded by two ravines, which bring a lot of scenery to the site and which slope down about 10 meters. In order to develop the project, since the area of land is so big, it would have to be divided into phases starting with the vacant land and the corner area of the site to develop phase one, and then moving into the site, subsequently developing phases two and three. The main, and or another main reason why there is phasing in this project is to offer housing to people whose houses were demolished. Since while the focus of the target audience is the Venezuelan community, this project would be available for anyone who needs it, regardless of their nationality. I selected an area of the site to develop a typical building that could then be replicated throughout the site. Starting with a solid mass that was then transformed by dividing it, adding and subtracting to it to create more open and versatile spaces. Finally, it was divided into six stories with the first story divided into housing and services, and the other five just for housing. While proper housing is the main challenge faced by the diaspora, unemployment and isolation from the community are frequent as well. For this reason, this proposal offers a variety of services on the ground level of each building, including a school, daycare, workshops where they can make their own furniture, offices to help with migration documentation, markets, retail, medical services, and more. The idea is to offer a variety of public spaces for the entire community and for the residents, to create spaces like Jardín El Mirador, where residents can grow their own crops, connect with nature, and exercise. Also, spaces like Plaza La Esquina, which bring people together to play, eat, or buy produce from the markets around. The building complex consists of a series of four main housing buildings, eight smaller housing buildings, and a school. Each big building has 245 units, while the smaller buildings have 40 units. The idea was to design a space where nature blends in with the built environment, and for that reason there are multiple exterior spaces around each building. The orientation and placement of the buildings relates to the orientation and location of the city, which allows for more cross ventilation and increases the amount of natural light that enters the units. Looking at the typical ground floor plan, the public spaces and services are placed along the main streets, while the units look towards the courtyards and interior streets within the complex. 
Each building has two courtyards, with grilling areas, children's playgrounds, and courts, as well as a central garden for crops. The corner plaza is strategically placed in the intersection of the streets, close to public transportation stops and towards the most active part of the area. As previously mentioned, cross ventilation is one of the main sustainability strategies used in this project. Windows on both sides of all units and screens allow wind to blow freely throughout the entire building. Also, floor to ceiling windows increase the amount of natural light. Quito receives an average of 12 hours of daylight all year round. In order to take advantage of it, solar panels are placed on the roof to partially power the buildings. Additionally, local plants are used in the courtyards to create more shade for people using the spaces. Plaza La Esquina is said to be the most active and public part of the complex, where people come together to engage in the community. With multiple seating areas, street vendors, and even a splash pad, the community will be able to find a new plaza in the city and make it a new landmark within Quitumbe. Along Avenue Condornian is the main site entrance to the complex, which takes residents into the main interior street. A series of murals, balconies, and screens cover the concrete facade along all sides of the buildings. Concrete was selected as the main material since it is easily accessible and affordable, considering 61.6% of all constructions in Ecuador use concrete as the main material for walls, and 91.8% of constructions use rainforest concrete for their structure. As it can be appreciated here, each unit has a small balcony, and there are bigger terraces alternating on each floor. The interior courtyards are the most active space in the interior of the complex. These are the public spaces for the residents to share, get to know each other, and form a community within La Unión. These courtyards are visible and easily accessible from all units. The space is designed so that it can be used by all residents, regardless of their age. Looking even more closely to the interior of the spaces, specifically the units, these are designed so that they are versatile modular spaces. All of them are 10 by 7 meters, but can be rearranged according to the needs of the residents. Using foldable walls and fixed furniture in the bedrooms, like Murphy beds, they can be transformed from one to three bedroom units. As it can be seen in this drawing, all of these units ser serve different groups of people, from roommates to large families and even single individuals. Yusmani, the Venezuelan woman I had the opportunity to interview, currently lives in a rented room with her two daughters. In a unit like this one, designed for her, she would have the opportunity to have her own room and one for her young daughters, as well as a comfortable living space. Samuel, the young man I interviewed, currently lives with his girl girlfriend and two other friends. In a unit like this one, just for him and his girlfriend, they would get more privacy and commodity and even room for a working area in the apartment. Horacio, Victor, and Fran currently share a crowded bedroom with other people. In a unit like this, organized as a dorm for roommates, they would all get to have room for their own beds, as well as working spaces to work from home. Additionally to the units, as previously mentioned, there are a couple of interior terraces in each floor for the neighbors to share. These spaces allow more light, ventilation to the building, and further promote a sense of community within the residence. In conclusion, La Unión seeks to provide the diaspora a place to live, work, and connect with the community. The goal is to provide Franklin, Yusmari, Horacio, Victor, Fran, Samuel, and the other thousands of Venezuelans who have been forced to leave the country a ray of hope by providing them a safe place they get to call home.
Thank you. I would like now to open up the floor to any questions or comments. So Victoria, you should have the opportunity now to share your screen and bring up your PowerPoint and then we can begin to respond to any questions. Well, if I can jump in first, um, I'd like to commend you on this project, uh, obviously because of the need um, and some very smart moves you made from the very beginning. So for instance, there are a lot of refugees that have been going to Colombia, for instance, but the problem in Colombia is that they have their own situation with internally displaced people to deal with. So you selected Ecuador that has a lower population that can absorb, you know, an influx of, of new people coming to their country. And I like the way you've thought about this in a sort of socioeconomic way of blending them into the existing community and that you brought them into an urban situation versus a rural situation. Probably a lot of these people are coming from rural, um, perhaps rural areas of Venezuela. So I think you know your idea of looking at a holistic ecosystem for them that not only uh, provides opportunity for housing, but for education, for jobs, and perhaps this could even be a public-private partnership if the government provides the land and if there are developers who are interested in taking on the actual construction of your project, then I, I think it can be um, very successful then. Um, it's, it's interesting that you've looked at both education, density, jobs, and perhaps there's even a component that could be tourism where there could be other uh, opportunities to generate uh, revenue to support something like this. So I think that's kind of the next step for you. You've selected a site that you said it's vacant. Somebody owns that or, or there's some control over it. And I, I think you can polish this off and actually make it a real proposal. Uh, there's a need. Um, there are NGOs that are looking at this uh, need for, for housing and for refugees, uh, the United Nations, obviously. And um, this is, it's, it's very admirable that you've selected this as, uh, as a project. So now you can take it forward and, and make it real, but whether you knew that or not, but uh, beyond being a thesis. So congratulations, this is a great project. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in uh, and kind of piggyback what Michael said. It's a fantastic project. I always, I always enjoy projects where students, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. I always enjoy projects where, uh, where students not only look at a socioeconomic political uh, condition, but, take a but make a polemic. And uh, you've clearly taken a stance on this project and went full forward on that. So that's huge, right? Um, I do have a, a couple of questions, though, and kind of comments rolled, <laughs> rolled into that. Uh, you know, My Michael, uh, you know, brought up the fact that, th okay, so there is a population shift that's happening, and it happens across the globe, especially in the global south. Uh, I, I think your location that you decided to, to take is, is fantastic for the same reasons that Michael said. Uh, but then you're, you're looking at a population, that, again, who's, who's being shifted from one, not only one country to another, but again, one kind of socioeconomic system, one type of area, rural to urban. Uh, you've done a fantastic job of, again, programming that ground plane to, to accommodate, not only accommodate, but grow and, and activate the ground plane as well. But now my question is though, is one, the material choice of concrete. You know, when you take people from a certain environment, you kind of, you, at least I would think about, you know, what's the most comfortable way for them to adjust to a new area? Is there, are there are there things that I could extract from their from their current culture from the current living conditions that I could start to implement into the urban environment? I, I think your project is extremely is very rational in a sense, right? And there's a fidelity to the current urban environment that's there, not only in the layout but in the articulation of the architecture. 
And I wondered, in, if we go back to the material, do you choose a different material than concrete? Uh, you mentioned you chose concrete because of sustainability, but concrete is probably one of the least sustainable materials. You know, once you take it in, you not only get in the concrete to site, but then also the steel that goes into play, we have to rebar. Um, could you have used wood? And then again, that's that's almost I'd imagine that's almost taking again a material that these these that your target community is is kind of used to having in a sense, right? Uh, then there's also the layout of the architecture. You said that it's integrate it integrates itself with the with the landscape, but again, it's, there seems to be a sort of allegiance to the grid of the of the city, and I wonder, you know, maybe the ground plane is very rational in of itself, right? Because that's just the, you know, that's the more the public areas, but then what happens on top is more what informing of its and its and its layouts and more reactive to, again, like you said, the prevailing breezes, maybe the, the land, the overall landscape in of itself. So there'd be a shift, there'd be a change probably. And uh, it, this is not a form finding exercise, but it's, again, it's a different articulation of the architecture. Uh, and you know, you know, the, and uh, with that, I, I don't mean to run on, but you did a fantastic thing by making it single loaded and not double loaded. Uh, you know, we here in LA, there is a, we have great weather, so people like to be outside. And you know, in some communities, uh, some of the more let's say less wealthy communities where they take public transportation a lot, you know, you want to arrive home, and you want to feel as if some sort of relief. And going down this dark corridor to your home is not that. So I think it's, it's, it's great to go single loaded for a variety of reasons. That's one. Um, and then, but I also want to ask then, as like if we look at the image that you have here, you go one, two, three, four, five, well, I think five, five levels above podium. And Charles Correa, uh, who you should know, and if you haven't, you probably should look up, look up uh, some of his work. Uh, he, oh, he's mentioned this before, and I grew up in New York, so I, I lived in a tenement building for a little while, is once you go three stories up from the ground plane, there's a loss of ownership of that public space that's on the ground plane, right? And in a project like this, where you have the terraces, like you should, you should have ex exploited that so much more, right? You should have like taken that another, because the idea, the DNA of that idea is there, right? Where you create public spaces above and you create ownership of that, like that could be expanded so much more, it could be park. Um, you yeah. can start to play where that occurs, whether that's be, you know, whether that starts on the third level or there's an occupation on the fifth level. But what you wanna do is make sure that, that everyone has, feels like they have ownership to public space on some certain level. And that's funny, that's that, where some urban gardening can happen. Exactly, no, exactly, and, that, exactly. And, that's, and that's where I was gonna go as well, exactly. So then, so then, that, that, then you start to bring in that aspect of the urban garden, like, like you were saying, Michael, right? And then, and then it becomes also, I would start to look at the metrics of my urban garden, like how much is produced, how much could go to my community and that could be, how much could be sold off of my, uh, outside of my community. Um, but again, I'm just throwing all of this out there because you've given so much to think about and so much to chew on. And everything that I've said, to be honest, is not like, is not as if it's just like a new idea that's generated. It's, it's something that stems from something that you already have. So yeah, to I, further develop it. Exactly, exactly. So don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's a fantastic project. Yeah. I, I agree, uh, Victoria, beautiful project and very well presented. Um, the one thing to, to sort of continue on what uh, Corey was saying is in terms of materiality, in terms of these outdoor spaces, which I think are gonna be the heart of the project and the places where uh, community starts to really build in, in, this, in this larger community. Um, those terraces, those larger terraces seem like an opportunity where you could start to insert a bit of a different character. So could they be a different color than the red? So from the exterior, we get this clue into what's happening in these spaces. Um, and then maybe they become a beacon of sorts for the residents themselves. So you could say, you know, meet me at the red terrace or meet me at the green terrace or meet me at the um, garden terrace on the fourth floor or something. So that that just seems like a, an opportunity that you could you could continue to develop in terms of creating identity for the project. Yeah, I think um, that's a great idea. And 
Um, I just wanted to go back for a second in terms of the material and the concrete that Ori just mentioned. Um, another reason why I selected the material is because since the beginning, I wanted to propose a project that could integrate the community even in the construction since like the early beginning. So they are familiar with the material because it's also the most common material for construction back home in Venezuela. So it's a material that they could even work to build the this project. Um, but going back again to the to the terraces and, and that the urban gardens and all that, I think it, it's a great idea also implementing more colors as you were just saying, I think that would be a great opportunity. So yeah, I, I know there's definitely a lot of room to grow and further develop this project, but thank you all for your, for your comments. Victoria, is the entry to the uh, residential buildings always on the sides there? When, when you come in, I see on the ground level plan there, there's a door on the left and a door on the right there. Is that, is that how you get into the residential complexes? Yes, there. I don't know if you can see where I'm pointing at. Do you see my mouse? Yeah, I just want to, I guess there's a ground, like right here, there's an entry there and an entry there. Is that correct? Oh, looking at the, yes. So you, there's an entry on that corner, correct? And then in the opposite corner, yes. Um, I guess one thing that would concern me a little bit, and, and then your social program and the way, the problem you've identified, I think is is quite good and dealt with that in a very nice way. I, I think one thing that I think could be stronger would be um, the sense of entry into these courtyards, how you actually get into the courtyards and the hierarchy in, in embodied there, you know? So for example, if you go back and you look at social housing projects like Red Vienna and the perimeter blocks that were done there, or some of the things that were done as part of the worker housing in places like Rome, there's always kind of a clear hierarchy, like an archway you come through into a courtyard, which the whole community filters into, and then they split off into, into other courtyards. And it makes me wonder whether um, the project would be well served maybe by entering in a more obvious way in relationship to the street, maybe entering the long skinny courtyard first and then going through archways or some other way into the other buildings so that there was a much clearer sense about you know the the sort of almost public courtyard and then the kind of private courtyard for the residents and that the the architecture orchestrated that built up levels yeah. of privacy in each of the courtyards and you know i'm thinking of things like um uh perimeter block things that were built in the 19th century in rome in the prati or, or, or piazza bologna and places like that or piazza there's another one there but they're, they're really beautiful sort of perimeter block things but what they do is they build up a kind of social organization by one courtyard clearly being about this grouping and another being about that grouping and a courtyard in the middle like in your ground floor plan i'm looking at being something that everybody traverses and I think I think I would be looking in further development for a much stronger sense about how the architecture supported that sequence and levels of public and privateness on the ground plane. It's a little bit abrupt to have the basketball courts and the soccer and things right outside somebody's window. So you could probably include more landscaping and garden walls and things that could give those units that are down at the ground plane a little bit of a set off from there, the, the, the sort of American stuff like Sunnyside Gardens and Chatham Village um, in Pittsburgh did that sort of thing really well where they had the little gardens that then people could enter their unit off grade, but there might be something um, above them, different units above them. So it would be the orchestration of those levels of public and private, both with landscape and how the architecture supports that, that I think I would be looking to enhance in the next stages of this. Yeah, I, I definitely see what you're saying. And I, I agree. I, I tried to create that transition from the units in the ground level to the courtyards by stepping down the courtyard a few, uh, like it's three steps. Um, but yeah, it, it might not be enough. Um, so, well, that, so yeah, that, I definitely. That's certainly, that's certainly a recognition of it. Probably landscaping would help too, yeah. since yeah. So probably landscaping would help make the courtyards also um, more human places there. And it could well be that the soccer fields are more appropriate for this for this group. I don't quite know, but I think that'd be something I'd be looking to enhance.
Thank you. I have a question. Uh, did you look at Rue de Lyon in Paris for this project? I'm sorry, can you, can you say that again? I asked if uh, what your president, you looked at Rue de Lyon in Paris for this project. Suzanne, could you type the, you're breaking up. If you could type the name of the project into the Rue de Mew, Andrew Piano. It's a piano, a project Paris, Rue de Mew. The, the Renzo Rue yeah. Street, and Mew. Yeah, in Paris. It's very, very familiar. And so I was asking if you, you looked at, if that's the project that you looked at. Oh, uh, no, it's not a project oh, yeah. that I really looked at. Okay, okay, because it's detailed and, and a lot of the similar things I did in the project, so, so it was interesting. But anyway, I, I, I want to comment for not just providing healthcare to refugees, but uh, providing quality of life. And uh, everything they did for the residential unit is wonderful flexibility, cross ventilation, interior exterior, have any problem. Concrete I think in, in this and normally and so mixed, so it's probably the material to you. Um, and, uh, I, I agree a few things that just indicated, and also that hopes can uh, be more devil can be a guard. That that's um, something that add, but. It's a wonderful project. I have to live there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And as Suzanne, as we move ahead, you may want to shut off your video because you're breaking up and it may be a problem of bandwidth. So if you shut off the video, the oftentimes the audio signal will boost. Then again, sometimes it won't. Can I jump in, Brian? Brian, before yes, it runs. Please, please, please jump right in. Um, so I wanted to uh, build on what um, Matt was saying. And I really think his points are well taken. And it seems like the next la layer of development um, is thinking about those, um, the way one enters the um, series of courtyards, a sense of And um, to build on that, it feels like you can also start to play a little bit with the character of those courtyards and their their shapes, perhaps. Um, and I wonder also about um, thinking about the different age groups of people that might be there. So the courtyards might be big enough to be able to have like a, a playground for younger children or a place for elders to hang out, but not necessarily the scale of um, of the of um, the soccer fields, etc. Um, I was also wondering about the potential for the roofs on your buildings. It seems to me that that's really great real estate that could be used uh, for public space and for green space, and potentially for uh, community. Um, you know, you know, if we look at the Unité d'habitation or we look at other things like that for community functions, and the other place. I thinking at least in some parts and perhaps it's where the entrance is, that the first floor level is a taller level than what you have. And if we kind of think about what uh, Matt was also offering in terms of the issue of entrance, that if that level is more, you know, like becomes like a, the, a flow through level and you had fewer apartments there, or perhaps you only had apartments on the wing sides, but not on the shorter edges, um, we might get uh, a better flow through into those spaces and um, in other places where you choose to keep the apartments or housing, then you use some of the strategies that, um, that Matt was offering about giving some kind of protection uh, to those apartments. Um, so those are a couple of things I would offer as you move forward. Yeah. Uh, the other 
um, that that um, that Suzanne just offered is the courtyards of these beautiful trees inside. Um, and so thinking about the character of those spaces um, and what how they differ also, you have these open-ended courtyards that open out to that ground space in the back. And I wonder um, how you get both the potential of that vista, but also the sense of um, some sense of enclosure or privacy there. So all those layers. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I, I really uh, thought the roof uh, comment was interesting because I uh, didn't necessarily think of that or get there. But I agree, it's uh, great real estate and it could be further developed for even more exterior um, spaces or community spaces for the residents to share um, as well as I see what Professor uh, Bell just said um, and what you, you mentioned of giving a little bit more privacy uh, to the units uh, that are on the ground level and even uh, to, the, to the courtyards within the rest of the complex. But also giving more public space too. So yeah. it's kind of finding that. And I do think the example in Red Vienna um, is a great one, um, as are the other ones that um, Professor Bell offered to you. Thank you. I think it's also about a range of public spaces. I think there's an element of efficiency here that you've had to apply to this project in a, in a commendable way. You've you've solved in a very efficient way how to bring these people together, how to give them access to you know, different kinds of outdoor spaces. But I would really critique that the outdoor spaces here are, are perhaps over-programmed. The, the athletic field, I think it becomes, a, a, again, a kind of from a culture of efficiency, it's very efficient to put these programs there. We can imagine teenage and you know, young adults being able to come out and play this, but I wonder if there's just unprogrammed space, it doesn't necessarily revolve around the athletic field for young children, for other kinds of social events that, you know, maybe social gatherings or, or celebrations uh, that wouldn't want to take place on a soccer field or on a basketball court. And so I think that it, it's, it's both commendable. And to me, I think a lot of these comments uh, about the, the rooftop or about the kinds of courtyard spaces, the types of entry or the thresholds to entry are all things that got masked inside this striving for efficiency and trying to get the, the amount of people, the amount of units, the flexibility. I think the flexibility inside your unit that you're talking about is really commendable to think about how the same kind of space could be programmed for a family, could be done for an individual or a couple. I mean, the range of family types that are gonna come through here, I think would really need that, that that level of development, that level of interest. But I think the outdoor spaces need the same kind of thing. I think just kind of always having a kind of basketball court on one side and a mm -hmm. soccer field on the other side loses the potential for other kinds of things. And this is always a challenge. I think here you've tried to develop an archetype that could develop not here just in this site, but in other places in this city, in other countries, in this region. I think at that level, the efficiency and how you've thought about bringing the people together, the program elements together, the indoor outdoor relationships. But to take it to the next level, you'd really have to think about opening up and, and getting this uh, more diverse range of kind of, to me, the public spaces are the places where it needs more uh, development. And Mike, but I think it's, it's a really wonderful project. Mike, to chime in, I, I think one thing that Victoria and I discussed but didn't get resolved here is we either have big basketball or small soccer if you look at the footprints of the yeah. uh, of the field so it's either <laughs> miniature soccer or giant basketball right. yeah horseback yeah. basketball All right it's a, it's, definitely it's mini, small soccer <laughs> yeah mini, mini soccer and Olympic basketball <laughs> we have Breeze and then Sanhi Hi everyone. Okay, let me know if my audio starts cutting out and I can turn off my video as well. Um, thank you for the project. Thank you for a very clear presentation. It's much appreciated. Um, I had a couple of questions and comments which are probably gonna piggyback on a lot of what has already been said. Um, but one, uh, I guess one of my first questions is when you talk to the people in, in uh, Venezuela, did you um, inquire with them about like what their current housing situation or what their housing situation was like in Venezuela? And I'm just kind of curious to hear you talk about that a little bit. Like, what? how did they live there um, before they had to move away? So specifically, the the housing 
their housing back home is not a question that I asked. I was definitely more interested in knowing their current situation in Ecuador. Um, but uh, being a Venezuelan and knowing uh, mm -hmm. about how people live there um, and what the country is currently going through, um, most of these uh, people who I interviewed, uh, I would assume, I guess, uh, that owned the small houses where they lived, um, but weren't able to uh, afford even food. And that's why some of them even left walking the country um, and now rented uh, small rooms, not even in an apartment, but rooms within an apartment to share with other people. So I would assume uh, it. a lot of people um, back home, they own uh, their own houses, smaller in any size of, of house. And now since they migrated, they were only able to, after some of them even sleeping on the streets uh, for weeks or months, renting a room. Uh, yeah. Right. I guess a, a part of the reason I'm asking, and I think it was sort of said a little bit earlier, is one of the things that, you know, I, in your analysis, you brought up, you know, those images of, of refugee camps which we've all seen many times and we all know look like horrendous conditions to live in for anybody. Um, and part of the problem with those camps, aside from them being outside of um, urban environments and, or just, you know, in general, they're very removed from, from anyone within the culture that they exist, is that there's a sense of, there's a homogeneity to those, um, those environments um, that's impossible to get away from. And so what you end up doing is you take people that come from a variety of different backgrounds in different places and different regions of, of, of place of a single place. And then you put them all into a single thing with a tent that all looks the same. Um, and I think that that's something that um, is obviously very problematic about those. And so it, it's sort of, uh, I guess, uh, what I would say is a little bit of my critique for this project is, um, you know, I think you're doing, there's a lot of interesting things that you're doing with the fact that like these units are changeable um, in size and stuff, but there is in general a, a very strong homogenous sense to what you have, like all of the single loaded corridors are the same, like the apartment, all of the, the units are really the same, even though they're changeable within. Um, and then it, again, as like we, people have talked about sort of the public spaces, you know, like does a farmer, um, and a university student really want to live in the exact same environment and same space and have the same access to, to something right outdoors or not outdoors, right? Like, I think like thinking through a little bit about the heterogeneity of the community that you're bringing to that together could actually be a, an interesting way for you to start um, articulating the architecture and producing architecture that produces difference, um, which I think could actually, uh, you know, just embed a lot more a lot more within the project. Um, and then I guess one of the other things I was thinking about was just in general what the sort of phasing um, idea is. I mean, I think another thing, like do you, do you see this project as something that like people from Venezuela who are refugees like move here and stay here? Or do you see this as a place where people come in, learn something, have, this is like the first place that they come to and then they disperse out into the rest of Quito and buy small houses, you know, I think that's, I think that's something else that you could think about while you develop this project that one of the things I think, again, that you said that was really interesting, even like placing the project close to a train stop, like, you know, the minute people come here, wherever they come from, like, this could be a haven for them, and could be the first step of their introduction into this country and into this culture. But then how do they move on from that? Like, how do they eventually then ideally get a house out somewhere else? Right? Like, how do you develop them and how do you integrate? I think one thing that's really important is how do you integrate the Venezuelan culture and the Ecuadorian culture together, right? Because I think there's a very important message um, that you want them to be able to integrate within Ecuador and you want them, you want Ecuadorians to be able to integrate with the Venezuelans, but you also don't want them to lose their own sense of identity as Venezuelans, right? Like they forcibly are essentially, they're forcibly being moved from their own home and how can you connect them back with that home? That's sort of why I asked if you would talk to them about what their um, sort of original housing conditions were because what I would, what I would love to see in this project is you know, the single loaded corridor is an, is a, is a pro, is a, um, an archetype, a, a, a typological condition of equatorial housing. What are the different prototypes of, of Venezuelan housing that you can then start to imbue within this project, right? How can you start to make people feel at home as almost as if they were 
in Venezuela, in Ecuador, within your project. Um, and I think that would really start to develop sort of a, a much more rich um, uh, project that would start to take refugee housing into, into another level. Um, Right. Couple Thank of you so much. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, see what you're saying and see kind of the repetitive unit. I did try to focus on creating that same seven by 10 unit as versatile as possible from the inside, uh, but definitely looking at it from the outside, they are all the same. So uh, I see your, your comparison with the refugee camps and the project uh, that you mentioned. Um, and then uh, to answer your, your question or your comment in regards to how they can make this project their own, what I was thinking again is of them building their own home um, and then creating it their own also by forming this sense of community, being able to identify with other Venezuelans who are going through similar situations, even if you're a farmer or a student or a lawyer who had to migrate from, from Venezuela to Ecuador um, to be able to connect since we're you're all or they're all going through through the same situation um, and then aspects like courtyards in the buildings are something that is very common both in Ecuador and I feel like all um, Latin America so I, I tried to implement certain things but yeah the single loaded um, aspect is typical of Ecuador so and I think that's where you could also start to um, play with things even a little bit more right like let's say let's say the project is about courtyards if you're if you're Let's say the thesis is, you know, like there's the single loaded corridor of Ecuador and then courtyard is something that's going to be uh, critical to the development of the project. And maybe the courtyards are, again, I think as many people have said, maybe the courtyards are the things that start to vary um, in terms of, uh, of what they do, how they're sized, you know, playgrounds, fa urban farms, um, uh, plazas, uh, you know, there could be like multi-level courtyards. Maybe one is like a dance club for you know, for young people, you know, I think you could really, you know, really start to get a variety of different programs that, that these people remember and that are new to them. And, and then, you know, that, that becomes, and you do it through the architecture, right? Like the architecture becomes the way that you are able to sort of integrate and re, re, reinvigorate these people within, um, within Ecuador and to remind them of their own, you know, previous life. Next, no, we're, we're, from Son he, we're going to hear from Sonhee Kim next, and then we're going to have to move on to the, the conclusion with, uh, with Professor uh, Juan Burke. Sonhee? I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, congratulations for your exploration and wonderful thesis. And this is such a timely and very adaptable um, project type that not only for the displacement, but also um, a whole lot of the um, housing related crisis that we are experiencing here as well. Um, one thing I kind of, I looked at the, your massing development and it is very rational, start from the massing and then breaking into certain orders and uh, um, priorities that may, um, may act as a form giver. And one thing that I would like to see here is how does the nature um, guide you in forming the massing because you talked about um, the one of those the prototypes that you see in Ecuador is the cross ventilation I it make me wonder where the wind is coming from what does the wind may um, interact with the as it hits the site in the first mass and how does that actually change and vary make a variation on the subsequent massings and whether or not that could um, give you some cues on the different way of arranging spaces and something like that. So looking into the nature in a little more in depth and uh, the actually diving into the data, what does that give you as a form giver as well as placement of the program that could have been interesting to explore beyond very rational and organized massing that you have developed. And secondly, along with that is that I looked at, I think about some of those notion of equity versus equality. And I think you have, you developed a very, um, in a way that it's almost like a module that you can fit into many different, um, the program elements, whether it is for 
you know, space for two, space for five, families or singles or roommate situation. But it's always in the same area, same square footages, right? So just looking at it, it almost gives me the idea of how you might consider that those kind of the modularity in the level of equity or equality and whether or not that could give you the secondary rhythm that you can actually implore. And also combining that with materiality that, you know, concrete that is um, somewhat, um, you know, like a com um, compatible and uh, <clears throat> comfortable for the Ecuadorian as well as, you know, the people from Venezuela. But maybe that is giving you the main rhythm or maybe some of the superstructure. And then from that on, you can actually introduce secondary or maybe tertiary uh, materialities as well as a module. Um, and some of the interplay with the, you know, the combination of interior spaces and, and then the terrace spaces. So that can give you a breakdown into some of this rigidity of your facade development. So those are kind of the ideas that um, I think that would be maybe your, um, when this become a real project and yeah. making it to the real project, that is the secondary things that you may want to continue to develop. But this is a fantastic project and there are so much to um, discuss and develop and I congratulate you coming to this bar. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish the research could have gone further in analyzing a little bit more the data to take some of those aspects that you just mentioned into consideration. Um, just since the scale of the project is so big, um, I had to make certain more rational decisions to be able to fit the amount of people and be able to, to develop uh, the project. But yeah, uh, I agree with that. And so thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Juan Burke, the chair of this committee to bring us to conclusion. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the work that Professor Joseph Williams and Professor Brian Kelly did as part of the committee. Um, they were not previously mentioned. I also want to acknowledge just quickly the um, work that Professor Carl Dupuy put into this project. Uh, he, the, the spirit of Carl is, is here. It's in, in Victoria's project and, and I, uh, we, we cherish his, his memory. Um, just um, to, to speak about Victoria's uh, project is, is um, you know, it would require a lot of space and, um, but I want to commend her for the attention that she placed on an issue that has uh, got little attention in the, in the northern part of this uh, continent. This issue of forced migration of, of Venezuelans in, in South America is it's a huge issue. Um, and so I, when she initially came to me and asked me to work with her, I was, I was very enthusiastic about this project. As with um, any social housing projects, uh, which ex exist in this realm of, of very difficult decisions to be made regarding, on the one hand, um, rationality, pragmatism, um, order, uh, efficiency, et cetera, uh, that have to be faced with uh, issues of individuality um, and, and, uh, and the, the shaping of, of spaces uh, to, to accommodate different needs. Uh, this, is, this is always going to be a very difficult situation to, to reconcile. Uh, however, we, it, um, we, we were inspired, uh, Victoria was, was very inspired by a long line of modernist projects in, in Latin America, you know, for, from the Pedregurgo or housing residential complexes, uh, Mario Pani's housing complexes in Mexico City from the latter part of the 20th century to uh, Alejandro Aravena's uh, projects in the recent project that somebody brought up. So I want to take the, the, the time to thank the, the critics. Uh, you, you have made very, very good points. Um, I also want to uh, commend Victoria for um, negotiating a very complex program that is very difficult to present in a few minutes. Uh, the, there's, there's a daycare in there, there's a, a school, there, there are offices for, uh, employment accommodation there, you know, we didn't get to talk about the, the, the plaza that she designed, a market, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this was, this is, it was a huge project and I think she did a wonderful job. 
um, given the situation, um, difficult personal situations as well, COVID and all of that. So Victoria, um, congratulations. Uh, happy birthday. It's her birthday Thank today. You. Feliz cumpleaños. Muchas felicidades. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria, I want to I want to add to to that. Uh, it's been an honor to get to know you over the past couple of years. You have been the most gracious, most determined uh, student that I can possibly imagine. Particularly given the fact that this thesis, you've been living the life of this thesis. This is not some abstraction to you. And we look forward to the day when you can be back in Venezuela, be a productive architect, and invite us and, and give us a tour of a country that has come back and rehabilitated itself and is welcoming to its own citizens. So we, we are here to support you in the meantime, but we, we really do appreciate the, um, the time you've spent with us. We're now Thank going you. to go, go to the next thesis. If you could relinquish the screen for a second there. We're going to go to the next thesis, uh, which is Abba uh, Amidavar, and her thesis is Change is Coming, Pre-Adaptability for a Resilient City. Her committee members uh, are, uh, are her, her chair is uh, Joseph Williams, who will conclude at the end, myself uh, and Brittany Williams, uh, and we'll begin the uh, presentation now. Hello, my name is Ava Omidbar. Thank you everybody far and near for being here today. Before I begin, I wanna take this time to thank my family, friends, and committee for helping me through this process. Working virtually has been quite the experience and your messages of support and guidance have not gone unnoticed. I would also like to thank my mom, Dr. Bahar Farhani, for all of her encouragement and my dad, Hamid Omidbar, for his mentorship and introducing me to architecture in the first place. I wouldn't be as passionate about bettering the world without you two. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the indigenous people and their elders and ancestors of these lands and recognize the long history of violence, displacement, and loss of life at the hands of European colonists. I worked on this thesis on the land of the Manahawk and Piscataway peoples. My education provided on the land of the Piscataway people and the design of this thesis on the land of the Anacostan peoples past and present. Long before the cities of today were built, the indigenous people on what is now known to be the United States of America stewarded the lands they rightfully lived and worked on from time immemorial. May we learn to continue to honor and celebrate their practices, which have shown to create a more harmonious relationship with the land in which we design and build on, and look towards avenues to repatriate this land, which must heal from its painful history. My thesis is titled, Change is Coming, Pre-Adaptability for a Resilient City, which explores how pre-adaptable design can prepare our buildings for the pressures of climate change, in cities around the world that will inevitably face these challenges. We will start by talking about some information around climate change and the challenges we face in the future. Then we will discuss our need for adaptation and pre-adaptable thinking, why Washington DC is a great place for this type of case study, and the design strategy in response to the site's anticipated future. And while we may not see some of the effects of climate change in our immediate communities, climate change is not just coming. It is very much here for many people around the planet. The four images shown here are from two recent climate disasters, which occurred in just the past few months. In the left column, Typhoon Goni caused widespread destruction in the Philippines this past November. And on the right column, images from here in the United States of wildfires burning millions of acres along the West Coast in Alaska. We have seen that climate-related disasters have tripled in the last 30 years. The United Nations recorded 
1.4 million injuries and 700,000 lives lost from climate-related disasters in 2015 alone. In the U.S., 280,000 people currently live in chronically inundated flood areas, and in the next 30 years, the cost of flooding in coastal cities could be up to $60 billion a year on average. There are many different types of environmental risks overlapping one another around the country. More local to the East Coast, floods and hurricanes uh, have and will continue to increase in frequency and intensity due to increased sea temperatures and sea levels, amongst other factors linked to human-related climate change. And while we know about the typical places when we think of when it comes to these types of realities, such as Louisiana and Florida, there are many places that are becoming more and more like them. By 2040, it is anticipated that nearly an additional 300,000 properties housing over half a million people in the US will be at risk of chronic flooding. This is a doubling of at-risk homes between 2030 and 2045. These effects intersect with other areas of the built environment, but this thesis will focus on the building. These at-risk homes are many times built to insufficient building codes or improper zoning, causing many homes to be demolished. Currently, demolition accounts for a vast majority of debris generated by the design and construction field, most of which ends up in landfill. Development and construction methods as they stand in current and future at-risk areas will cost more in the long run and put many lives at risk. The building of buildings need to be reconsidered. So how do we account for climate pressures on buildings over time? The climate adaptation cycle recognizes that our environments are ever changing and we must be as well. One of the key elements to this is to observe and learn so we can plan for the impacts we anticipate and implement them into our actions, then repeat and readjust, readjust as needed. If we do not anticipate and adapt, we will continue to fail. This thesis proposes the concept of pre-adaptability, which can begin to solve some of these issues of waste and prepare for the future and is defined as a characteristic of a structure that is capable of being adjusted over time to various environmental and societal changes to minimize its ecological and economic impact while maximizing its lifespan. In disaster preparedness, there are three strategies used when focusing on mitigating risk related to coastal and riverine flooding. First, by protecting the area, then accommodating to the floods, and finally retreating and relocating. This project addresses all three. Pre-adaptability is inherently an initial step in the process of adaptive reuse. Many are studying ways to make this process easier for existing building stock, with many different levels of criteria which deem whether a building can be adapted or not. And as Fred Burkhart has found, from a cost perspective, a complete building rehabilitation costs about 16% less than construction costs and 18% less in construction time than new construction. Pre-adaptability participates by looking at ways of making adaptable strategies and criteria clearer from the beginning of the project to benefit future forms and enhancements to a building. And there are many strategies related to adaptability that have been laid out by Robert Schmidt's group in Loughborough University in the UK. The main categories noted here are adjustable strategies allowing for change of task, versatile strategies, which account for changing spaces, refitable design to allow for changing components, convertible design, which allows for changing function, scalability to accommodate changing size, and movable strategies, which allow for change of location. 
Here are two examples of projects which have incorporated adaptable strategies into their design. The Next 21 project is a residential project by Osaka Gas, designed by Yostika Uchida and Shuko Sha Architectural and Urban Design Studio, which is housing employees in a building with different energy systems to research and develop a model of environmentally symbiotic housing with their systems running through the corridor floors, allowing for easier replacement. Also, the cellophane house, designed by Kieran Timberlake Architects, which was installed in 2008 in six days outside of MoMA, the structural plastic, and disassembled within two days, generating virtually no waste and recovering 100% of the energy embodied in the materials. What these projects ultimately do is to save us time, money, and in many cases where adaptable buildings are most needed, these strategies can save lives and livelihoods. One of those places that can benefit from pre-adaptable design thinking is Washington, DC. It's not typically a place which comes up in mainstream conversations around the climate, climate crises of today, but it is a city like many others that is facing greater vulnerability to heat and flood. There are other cities which were considered, but Washington DC was one of the cities where the vulnerability of the future is much greater than today. It's also a, has a large level of community development and fast growth happening right now with a deep rooted urban history. The District of Columbia has already begun to anticipate this and research ways in which the district is vulnerable in various areas, mostly around flooding and heat. Those areas have been identified on this map. And area four um, is Southwest DC, which this project will focus on. Southwest DC has historically been part of the swampiest areas of the district and as you can see from this flood map, it continues to be an area of concern, part of which is protecting, protected by levees on the National Mall and Navy Yard. But as infrastructure ages, we know that levees fail and cannot protect every area around it. And as projections for floodplains show, these areas have high potential of flooding over time. In areas such as Southwest DC, development will proceed. And this thesis is proposing development in the same areas that will allow for a better way to protect the residents of the neighborhood and create more value within the area. North of the neighborhood on the federal level, the Southwest Eco District Initiative is underway, conducting refurbishment and renovations and adding infrastructure work such as rainwater catchment, one of the strategies that this thesis is focusing on as well. The Southwest DC neighborhood has already thought about its fundamental plan for the neighborhood and the community through its guiding principles, which this project acknowledges and honors with its design. One of which being the community's need to foster an environment that encourages and embraces cultural and economic diversity while also identifying the area as an arts destination within the district. The project site on 1004th Street Southwest sits on the intersection of the existing I Street Arts Corridor and newly developing 4th Street Retail Corridor, and right on the line between newly gentrifying luxury apartment buildings closer to the wharf and the residence built during the third major upheaval of the neighborhood within 100 years after the National Housing Act of 1949, a time which displaced many Black Americans and immigrants of this community. This project is a mixed use, mixed income residential building, which offers living and working for local artists with art studios inside the building and an arts walk along the northeastern part of the site. They also offer workshop studios for the community to engage and a residence artist gallery to give a space for the artists to sell their work.
This chart looks closer at different ways in which the building incorporates adaptable strategies. Most key to, its mod to this is its modularity, a design and time approach, which allows for the building to prepare for the needs of the site and prepare for a long life. The design is meant to be simple and clear to allow for future designers of the building to better identify new potentials. While the building is finished, there are areas which can be further completed in other forms, which will be discussed in subsequent slides. It identifies that the aesthetics and scale of the building should respond to its context. All of those strategies fall into the main categories of the Schmidt Group that the building can be adjusted, refitted, its function can be converted, the size is scalable, and ultimately this building is movable. Other strategies key to mitigating risk within the site is the protection of the site with raised foundations and lowering the courtyard ground plane accommodating to flooding via underground parking and a cistern system under a dry creek bed within the courtyard and providing the option for retreat through prefabricated modular construction. In this video, you can see how the building responds to heavy rain and potential flooding. Keep in mind that the types of floods shown in this video are not currently very frequent, but will become so within the next four decades. So we can see how that's draining here, and I'll let it play one more time. So how is this building designed? Uh, it starts with a structural steel cage reinforced with lightweight structural aluminum to create the modules that stack and connect to one another. These modules are the building blocks of the residential and corridor modules. The residential modules are built offsite and can be brought fully fit out by a flatbed truck. The dimensions are 20 by 30 by nine and can importantly stack on top of a platform installed on site using structural steel, allowing for a stable base, which elevates the units and frees up the ground floor as needed. In addition to the residential module, a 20 by 10 corridor module has been designed to allow for removable elements within the building along the circulation path. This corridor unit accounts for systems running vertically through the building, allowing for easy connection to the walls within the residential unit and ease of access for maintenance within the corridor. And as these systems stack in the building, you can see the layers of the modules here, creating a simple diagram of spaces and systems. When aggregated within a building form, you can see that there are areas of opportunity for different types of modular units, such as here with the terrace unit, which consists mostly of structural cage and a shell with railing. We see the building naturally fit into the outline of the site with openings on every corner, allowing for maximum porosity throughout, encouraging foot and bicycle traffic. On the northeast side of the site, artist cube fragments open up to the pre-established community and community buildings, such as the church directly north of the site and the library to the east. Additionally, contours on the site draw water towards the dry creek bed in the southeast portion of the green space within the courtyard, as previously seen in the video. Modularity in this case allows for freedom of form and a natural fit to the site's constraints. The regularity of the modules can be maintained within each unit as it stacks vertically while creating more organic forms as a whole. This liberates the building from awkward residential units 
with lost usable space. Humans typically look for regularity within their spaces, but when it comes to their external environments, we see that natural forms are much more preferred for adding better experiences within and outside of the building. As it stands now, a trail runs across the site. This project preserves that path and allows for it to continue to connect the neighborhood, creating a building that sits respectfully on the site. Recognizing that flooding may become overwhelming within the next several decades, the Southern Terrace leaves exactly enough space to relocate the artist cubes onto the fifth and sixth floors, removing them from potentially new floodplains and risk. We can do all that and we can make a building enjoyable and a healthy place to live, but ultimately climate change does not care it will come in and cause harm in ways that create unsafe living within areas that have long been inhabited. It's projected that in Southwest DC, it will face higher flood risks and potentially chronic flooding by 2080. This project is uniquely equipped to recognize those vulnerabilities and respond appropriately when time comes, giving the option for disassembly and relocation to a safer place. This allows for some security for residents of the building, while they may again become a part of the history of displacement within Southwest DC, this time it comes with agency and opportunity to move safely and with dignity. When all is said and done, the foundation is all that remains, creating a place for other programs to form when floods are not plaguing this area. Maybe the new building will consist of the same form. Maybe new potentials are realized when it's adapted and reused, but only the future can tell. Thank you for your time. And now we'll open it up to questions and comments from the reviewers and uh, welcome Professor Ponzi for joining us. Good to see you. Um, and if we could put up the uh, single PDF, that would be probably very helpful. It seemed to work in the last presentation. So, Abba, I think uh, we're ready to have some Q&A here. Everybody's speechless. I guess uh, I'll start. Uh, there is um. So is it is it Ava or Ava? I just want to make sure I pronounce uh, it. Ava. Yes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you, Ava. Uh, so thank you for such a uh, a strong presentation. I I do have a quick a couple of comments. Well, one is the the adaptability of it. Uh, you know that seems to be like a, a strong um, position that you've taken. However, the project seems to retreat more than adapt to, to climate conditions. And I think in this case where you created the framework for it to continually build up, I wonder if maybe if, like that could have been a position that you take is that you know, we embrace the, this, these climate conditions and then you know, whether the position of the building is, is stagnant and then it, again, it, it builds up from, this, from the floodplain. I think it would have been interesting to see it adapt rather than retreat, uh, uh, go along the lines of what you said. Uh, the other thing was the, you know, you, you mentioned the modularity, the modularity of the project uh, relating to the context. And I think that, well, I know that, you know, the modular nature of the architecture will lose context as it moves away, right? It will be less about that place. It, well, in and of itself, it's not about the place. It's just about the constru constructability of it, about the ease of constructability of it. And in this case, the entire life cycle and the deconstruction of it. Right, so that's that's your project. So I'd be careful when you start to say how it relates to the context, because then I would ask, okay, exactly how does it relate to the context, and then how will it relate to the next place? If I put, if I take this project, put it in Miami, put it in LA, put it wherever, like how how would that relate? Um, and then the other thing I do, I would say, is that even when this, even within this modular system, I think there's opportunities for customization on the facade. Uh, that's something I would, would have looked at as, as well. Um, uh, have you looked at Michael Moltzan's uh, Star Apartments? I have not. 
now. Oh, okay. I, I think that that would have been a great project for you to look at. So when I look at the terrace, you have the, you have a fantastic terrace view uh, that you're showing on your PDF, like to the top right. Uh, that's you know that goes to some of the comments that we made on the last project. But you should definitely look at Michael Moulton and Star Apartments, right? There's a podium level, and it's a, it's all a prefabricated project. Uh, but he creates a public space right above the podium level, and then elevates all of the all of the residential units. And it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful project. And the rationality that we that we saw we see on this project that we saw on the last project as well is is broken quite a bit. And I think that I think this project uh, adheres to again a lot of the kind of uh, pragmatism of that you typically say, okay, I have to have X amount of units, and you just putting them on top of each other. I think this project is so like the last would benefit from again breaking that modularity in its in its arrangement a little bit more because one of the things that you did mention too was use the term organic. Um, that's something that I'm just I'm not seeing either in section elevation or plan, but it's clearly something that you want because you've spoken about you know organic nature kind of customization et cetera et cetera quite a bit. And, I, and I, th I think if you like look at projects like that, or I, I made a comment earlier, like if you explore your project in section a little bit more and just been, been a little bit more explorative, that you would start to, again, break it up, uh, again, the modularity of the, of the overall design. But overall, a very good project. And uh, thank you for the clear presentation. Thank you. Um, I think to, to piggyback onto that too, I, I think the, the, the cubes that are sort of broken down and they're kind of fun uh, if there could have been a little bit more of that, at least in that leg of the building, sort of where they kind of touch, as if this uh, system that you have then starts to break down and sort of tear us down um, to sort of connect to those, because it's almost like, again, they're a separate project from this project uh, of the sort of systematic way of laying out the units. So it just, it just could have been more fun, I think, to, to sort of show it. I don't want to use the word decomposing because that's not quite right. But the way it's sort of breaking down to become these cubes uh, could be really interesting. Right, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think my the part that I appreciate most about the project is the, um, the maybe not decomposing, but the deconstruction of the plan from the grid. So you have this, you know, uh, quite a strict grid in the structural system and the modularity of the project, but then you turn one of the legs and then it yeah. turns again, and then it starts to, you know, come apart in these smaller yeah. units. And I'd, I'd say that is really um, one of the real strengths of, of the proposal. Uh, mm. The, it, it feels so severe on the exterior and, um, I think part of that is just the method of representation. So the programs that you're using for rendering this project um, have a bit of a plasticity to them. We're not plasticity, yeah. but a plasticness to them. Um, well, you have to be very specific. <laughs> Computers don't lie. Yes. Yeah. And I think uh, you want to be, you always want to be careful about the, pro don't let the program define Exactly. your project. So um, I think there's, there's the potential here uh, to, to have this shift in some really beautiful, because you know, your drawings are really beautiful, the black and white drawings um, and the, the axon with the, the exploded axon is really lovely too. Um, but I might relook at the, the rendering techniques because I don't know if they're being additive yet. Yeah, um, I think to address something that was brought up earlier about this building being um, adapting in, in a short term scale versus long term scale, I definitely think that there are more opportunities for accommodation on the site. Um, but I, I really wanted to focus on this idea of retreat as an option, which many buildings don't get to have. Um, and those designs aren't necessarily considered um, from you know, the initial form of a building. Um, and so that was really the, the prime focus of this project was how can this become something that can move? And I definitely um, appreciate the comment about context in its next location um, where this facade may not necessarily be um, you know, 
the most appropriate in a, a new context. Um, and that's definitely something I had not considered. So I do appreciate that. Can, uh, I, can I jump in? Oh, yeah. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes. Well, perfect. Uh, yes, I would. Uh, uh, I, I do agree with uh, uh, the comments that have been done about the homogeneity of maybe the excessive homogeneity of uh, of, of the elevations of the problem, which maybe it's just a representational uh, issue. But uh, I would say that uh, uh, the condition that you gave yourself for for the project and the program also is maybe too uh, specific uh, for the site. In other terms, uh, speaking about uh, uh, the reaction of the urban fabric to uh, frequent floods, uh, is, a, is a great uh, topic, and I think you uh, tackled it uh, correctly, but I would, uh, um, I would like to see even more engagement, more uh, specificity to, the, to this problem. Example, I see uh, the ground floor plan, and I understand that is uh, uh, somehow uh, generated by thoughts about flooding, but I would see it more radical about it. So a ground floor that can be emptied or can be completely uh, negotiated with uh, with the public, with the public, with public, with public space. Because to me, again, as uh, uh, Tolia, correct, uh, said about the elevation, I would say even about the the ground floor, it, uh, and maybe it's an effort to make it look exactly like all the other buildings, but to me, it's a little bit too much, like all the other buildings to make, to make really a difference. I would like to, 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 to pass by your building and to understand the, the willingness of creating something that considered that. And even in the drawings, maybe it, it, could, it could have been uh, fun to see these renders in case of flood in a, in a narrative way and with a different level of uh, uh, of the water. Programmatically speaking, I think that uh, housing for artists is, uh, is a great topic that gives you a lot of uh, uh, freedom in, in interpreting the, the housing program. But maybe uh, it's maybe too much spe specific in this case, I would have inserted germs of, of, of change, since of change, we are, we, you're speaking of change, in order not to create a, a ghetto for artists, which I don't believe a lot, where everyone must be somehow an artist, but to see students, to see, I would, I would have loved to mix this program with the program of the thesis before, to generate some diversity, which is, uh, which is crucial in order not to transform it into, you know, a theme park uh, of uh, artists. You understand? A zoo for, for artists. You understand? I think that you have, and the, the, the technology you are using gives you this potential flexibility to, to interpret each single block into a completely different, you know, uh, lifestyle, colors, and... Uh, and uh, and finishings in order to give it, but also I would love to see a small family living next to an artist or, you know, germs of diversity that I'm sure will generate uh, that uh, dehomogenization that uh, even Tolia was speaking, uh, was speaking about. Makes sense? I know yeah. my, my English is a little bit weird, sorry, but. Not at uh, all. Um, and <laughs> for bringing that up, um, just to re-clarify myself um, in my presentation, um, the project is not meant to only house artists. It is meant to give a portion of the building specifically to house artists. So okay. by no means is this going to be a place only for one, um, you know, one type of uh, Perfect. profession. Um, definitely meant to incorporate other people as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Artistry. 
industry. Yes. Well, I want to compliment you on a, a very thoughtful and, and well uh, presented project here. To me, I think there's two fundamental areas that we're already discussed. One is this idea of the you know, the, the exterior being this repetitive, you know, the, the grid and the repetitive nature of this structure comes through so strongly. I think the, the solution lies in the way you handled the corridors. So the idea that you have this unit that has to plug into a corridor piece, if you had had an external piece that the elevation had to be, you know, selected from a series of balcony types or different kinds of modules that could form the exterior, then the exterior would have naturally had a diversity based on the different kinds of uses that are going on the inside, the selection of the individual and the ability to adapt it to another place when this does get relocated. The idea that you could only have waste in the exterior portion or a reconfiguration of that exterior module that could plug on. I think you would bring a, a different level of adaptability if you had treated the exterior in the same way you treated that interior corridor module. The other piece here to me, the adaptability, and it's, it's there kind of latent. I don't think you expressed it enough, but the way in which you're bringing these different wings or pieces of the building together create a, a kind of typology of joint. There seems to be on the southwest corner a kind of gap where the two wings don't really touch. So that, that's one way, again, on a different site in a different city in a different climate, you could bring things together uh, in the, the south. Uh, eastern corner, you kind of have a finger joint, then you have the blown open corner, the kind of leaky corner with the module, then the other joint, you have some kind of a hinge. And so just those typologies of corner connections, I think, offers a range of adaptabilities to different climates, to different contexts, to different urban situations. So I think there's a lot there's a lot more latent in the system that you've done. And I think, again, like we saw with Victoria's project before this, I think somehow the the culture of efficiency and solving the problem and i think you've done a very good job at it but it's somehow there's a blind spot which is the opportunity of that system the opportunity of that module to be broken or to be bent and the way in which you've done it and you've, you've already done it just to solve the different site conditions of this particular site but if this whole building is going to be picked up and moved to another place it needs to have a range of other types so to me the adaptability just of the joints of the wings is something and the way in which each of these units would mediate to the exterior whether it's east west north south of the building let alone washington dc miami boston i mean other places that these modules could be deployed you've already set yourself up a great system for adaptability i think you just you're blind to the potential of the opportunity of, of the other pieces. But I think it's, it's a very, very well considered project. So congratulations. I think uh, I'm going to jump in next. Uh, I'm probably going to reiterate a bunch of what has already been said. But um, in a way, I think your thesis actually starts with the end of your presentation. Um, and that's not to say that you've done an incredible amount of work um, to come up with what you've come up with. but. Yeah, in reality, I think that your thesis is about the sort of dynamic response of architecture um, and how it adapts and how it potentially changes to what the environment is you know, about to do. Um, but what we ended up with, what we see so far is just sort of one iteration of this building on a single site. Um, and so I, I think I got the most excited when you started talking about disassembly, because I was kind of curious to see how does this thing get disassembled? What happens to it in its next phase? Um, you know, you've, you've talked about the idea of the foundations that remain, uh, what happens to those foundations? You know, I, I'm a little bit curious in a way to see more in this project about how, how does the environment, how does flooding and building interact? Like, do you design a building that actually allows flooding and the flooding of that building does something to the architecture, right? Like, how is architecture actually being responsive to the environment? Um, versus just potentially just moving away, which again, I think, and I think the way that you set your, your thesis up with the three different um, types of um, sort of adaptability, the, you know, adapting retreat and whatever the third one was, I think those are, are good. But those are sort of the three things that I, I, I would want to see happen. Like I want to see what, what are you proposing? What does the architecture do? How does the architecture do those things? Um, and to me, that's really what your thesis is. Um, versus, you know, sort of the single iteration of a residential 
an artist building on, on this one site. I think the, the video that you have where it starts to show flooding, I think that sort of thought of dynamics um, is I think what you should try to, to push forward with and to really explore. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, to respond to some comments about the ground plane, I definitely um, went through some inter iterations of how the ground plane adapts to flooding. Um, for this site, because of the, the severity of flooding, which is relatively low um, right now, um, the retail spaces and ground spaces um, stand as they are. And, and in previous iterations, I had explored movable um, retail spaces, which can aggregate um, in one part of the site. Or how are they? How are they movable? Um, so it would be through a ceiling system that uh, allows the walls to slot into the ceiling um, and slide and create different spaces um, so that the retail can change size or um, be removed completely um, so that if there is uh, too much flooding within the ground plane that the uh, basically the ground plane programming is relinquished from the, the site uh, to, you know, accommodate that risk um, or to just move from one part of the site to the other. Um, there could be many different versions depending on the needs and the risk um, that develops over time. Um, okay, let, me, let me throw out one thing, just like probably a terrible idea, probably really dumb, but let's say for example, like, uh, to me, what your thesis is really about is an exploration of how architecture can be dynamic to an environmental response, right? And how architecture can respond to environmental change. So what if like all of your modules were actually on rails and every as the flooding happens, every module starts climbing up because it has to. For example, again, not necessarily like the best architectural idea, but just something like that where like, you know, what I see is I see you doing, I, I see more a variety of studies of how it moves, how it moves off of site, how it changes, how it, all of those kinds of things, like how can architecture adapt? How can architecture be dynamic um, because of what's happening? And there are a variety, you know, flooding could be low, flooding could go hot, you know, and it could be different types of environmental changes. I think just thinking through different scenarios and, and different types of responses that architecture can produce, to me, that I think is what, your, what this thesis uh, is really about. No, I, I agree. It's, it's not about the retreat. It's about the adaptability. And yeah. it, it, to be honest, when you said when you said that when you gave the idea about the railings and you said it's a bad idea, I was like, oh, uh oh, I had the same bad idea. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> like, but what, should, what example? <laughs> because it could because I think there should have been a diagram of let's uh, just for simplicity. Let's say each module is 100 by 100. Like there should, we should see a diagram of these hundred by hundred if there is a studio. If it's, a, if it's now if 100 by, now if it's a hundred by 200, if there's a family, right? There's, we see that adaptability. And like Ferez said, then I, what I was also interested in seeing was the underground parking that you have. Like, what does that become when it becomes flooded, right? Is there, is there before it gets yes. completely flooded, is it a, a constructed wetland? Is there some sort of water retention that becomes purification that goes back up to the units? Like, but those are the things is that it's not the retreat, it's the actual adaptability. And I think in playing with the modularity that we, that we were talking about and have everything be different, is that would have automatically changed the kind of home, uh, the home, the homogenous nature of the of the architecture. And and just to let, let really quickly, just the the program, right? Like the idea that like parking could become a constructed wetland. Right. You know, a residential unit could become an a, all the residential units get flown out and become an educational facility where people actually come to the site to now learn about climate change or something like that. You know, I think both architecturally and programmatically, you can start to really evolve this completely. And I think, I think what all these comments are pointing to are, and I agree completely, is this kind of desire for more risk taking. And I think you were very, you know, you were, you were very careful and there's something beautiful about that. But this is also the time where you can really not, you know, really expand and try and push these um, more risky ideas before you go out in the world. <laughs> are working in a firm. 
Yeah, and I, I really appreciate this conversation because I think for me, what it does is it highlights all the potentials, um, which is really what I wanted this thesis to be. Um, and what I really um, believe, uh, and I hope I do as, as a designer, as I move into my career is, is creating opportunities for different forms from the initial design. Um, and so this is the first form of the building um, and um, to allow it to be open to interpretation and to become something else um, through another designer's lens um, and giving that opportunity um, in the future. And so I, I'm really excited about these comments and these ideas. Um, and some of them are things I had thought of as well from the beginning. Um, and I think, yeah, I wanted to make this a little bit um, more real from a standpoint of practicality. Um, and I do appreciate your comments about being a little bit more risky. Um, and definitely these are things I'm gonna be thinking about for, for a long time. <laughs> so we have time for one more comment. That'll be Sunhee Kim, who's been patiently waiting with her hand raised. And then after that, we'll pass this back to uh, Joseph Williams, who will do a summary. And just for everybody's purposes, I just received a message from Julie Gabrielli that none of you are reading the chats. The stage directions are in the chats. So I, 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 I'm trying to give you a sense of how much time we have left in the chats. So you might want to take a look at the chats on the side. Anyhow, Sonny, it's yours and then Joseph. Okay. So hopefully this is not a pattern, but you know, like an introverts that I just sit and wait and listen. And um, I appreciate all the <laughs> comments that coming in. And I think I learned a lot. First of all, um, Ava, I really um, thank you for your land acknowledgement that you started. Um, that is um, oftentimes said less, but it is very uh, powerful. And I thank you for that. Um, and second, second, um, I also thank you for um, utilizing the concept of retreat as part of the um, strategy. <clears throat> Oftentimes you see the, you know, whenever disaster hits, then um, the strong, the, the vibe that always comes back after is rebuilt. And it always, um, oftentimes it make me wonder whether rebuild is always the right strategy of the current situation. And oftentimes I feel like retreat being um, even more courageous um, options that we, uh, we choose. Um, however, for this particular project, I, it made me wonder, um, our goal as the building professional, you know, building professional is not to reach the point that we have to retreat and um, make a way that we act now in um, many options available and even more of the courageous decisions that we are making. Therefore, the climate change is not forcing us to retreat from the land that we know and love. Um, so I think that is kind of the things that is kind of the um, genesis of my question that this is a fascinating idea, but I think what is, um, and in introduction of the first chapter of So Many to Come, and one part of that chapter is actually diving in what would be the actual the environmental impact of this type of construction and you know mobility that comes with it and longevity of the units? So overall, the life cycle analysis or life cycle understanding of what does that mean? What how we how are we capturing the embodied carbon that is built into this modular construction and infrastructure that we are putting in? And by the time it is ready to be moved to other place by choice or force of nature, then what does that mean to moving it to someplace else? What is the overall impact in terms of the carbon? So your strategy um, of retreat is not another way of adding more of the carbon impact. So I think that is kind of the things that when we are looking at the adaptability, not just for the program elements of it, but also the life cycle and holistic ideas of what does that actually being impact, impacting for overall environment. That would be something interesting, a little geeky, but I think interesting things that we may want to explore and putting it in, 
uh, uh, one of our toolbox. But overall, this is very intriguing project and your risk taking, um, I want to see more of it. But at the same time, it is very complex and then very good ideas here and there. I think, you know, overall, it is a good introduction of more chapters to come. And congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely intend to explore those um, avenues that you mentioned. Um, and and I, if, if those are geeky to you, then I, I'm also a geek in that sense. So thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Joseph Williams, who is the chair of this committee, to bring us to conclusion. Thank you. Um, uh, what a wonderful project and what a joy to, to watch unfold, Ava. Um, it really was, you started from this, um, from what I thought was a very innovative idea of applying the ideas of pre-adaptability and even formal concepts and constructional concepts coming out of metabolism to the very current problem of climate change. And what a rich discussion from the juries. I'm, I'm so, uh, so delightful to hear you guys go back and forth. And you know you're on to something when there are so many comments about a certain theme. I think everyone was on board with your principal idea of a building that really adapts to the change and uncertainty of the environment rather than trying to keep it out. Um, because if you try to keep it out, it's just going to go somewhere else. And your building is more of a boon to your local community, both environmentally, but also uh, culturally by providing a place for artist residents, by kind of preserving the the fluidity of that green space, which is currently there by having connectivity between the corners of the program, just where people walk nowadays, where that present path is. You kind of transformed the courtyard typology from a fortress to, to a more open uh, environmental feature. And so a lot of people had great ideas for how you can expand on your idea here. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to emphasize what I think is a major contribution of this thesis, that your, your uh, design process was based around the module and kind of, it's kind of the, it's kind of inside out from a lot of design process. You start from the module, you start from the part and you think about how the whole can serve the part. You think about how each module, each unit uh, has to satisfy a set of environmental criteria, and that module can even move around uh, as beautifully expressed visually by those, um, those artist pods which spill out into the courtyard, and you can see where they might be, um, where they might be refitted onto that sixth floor terrace. There's a kind of nice tension between those two elements across the courtyard. Uh, so your aesthetic was about the whole serving the part rather than the part serving the whole. And it gave you so much dynamism in adapting to the site and the environmental conditions uh, confronting it. I also wanna say that Ava prioritized a few things that she found were very important. There were a lot of ideas we went through. There were some more ambitious ideas about how this building could be um, potentially built up in increments depending on need. And it would kind of be this always in process structure, adding more modules at a time. We figured that would be a, an, a real estate development thesis as well as an architecture thesis and it got way too complicated economically. So uh, of course that's, that's perhaps the next chapter in the, in the saga, but you prioritize saving embodied energy on the reconstruction of a building on a site that becomes uninhabitable because you can take these modules and reassemble them somewhere else at a small fraction of the cost it would take to rebuild the building. So I commend you on taking a complicated problem and zeroing in on what you thought were the most important priorities. So I think a good job all around. Thank you, Professor Williams. I'd like to have us do a five minute break here. So at the top of the hour, uh, we'll come back just so everybody has an opportunity to 
have a little comfort break. Um, we'll be back. I'm not going to go offline. I'm just going to shut my picture off. For those of you on YouTube, Facebook, or Panopto, we are in the middle of a break. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Andrea. Can you hear us? Yes. I'm okay. not sure because I've, I've, I haven't been using Zoom too much and I am alone now at the studio. So I may have uh, some problem. We can know. hear you well. But Welcome now I, I am just in touch with you, I think. No, I don't see. No, that. everybody hears you right now. Everybody around the world listening to this. Okay, well, that's, that's not good for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry for the other day. I, I, I can't. No problem. You're here today. We're very happy. Uh, I know. No, now I can stay. I can stay. I, I, I have noticed your message just a few minutes ago. Perfecto. In it, Perfecto. and um, we can go on for some time. I, I imagine today, no. Yes, we go. Uh, we'll, we'll break uh, in an hour, and then we'll continue this afternoon, starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. Okay. And we're going to get going here. So here we are, everybody. Put your right. seatbelts back on. I will be on. here till I drop. Okay, <laughs> <Benissimo. laughs> You know, it's, it, here is already like sunset, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> the sun never sets on Florence. Come on. No, never, never. You're right. Uh, we have uh, the God has been very benevolent with us. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get ourselves going here, folks. So as people are coming back on board, we'll get the presentation set up for um, for Min Na. Uh, Min's thesis chair uh, was Peter Noonan. 
uh, and her committee was comprised of Jana Vandergoot and myself. And her thesis is located in Bethesda, Maryland, and it's titled Framing Aging as Growth Through Community. And I believe we're all ready to go. It looks like everybody is back and refreshed with a fresh cup of coffee in front of them. And let's hear what Min has to say. Hi, everyone. I'm Min Na. My thesis title is Reframing Aging as Growth Through Community. The agenda starts with aging population in America, impact of population aging and age biased discrimination, and moving to site Bethesda, Maryland, and design proposal. So you can see here the map of gray America by a rapidly aging population. This shows the distribution of the senior population in 2020. Many states are reaching the point one fifth of its populations are already aged 65 and older. In Maryland, one out of every six people is seniors. Why does this happen? First, our life expectancy has increased over time. By the end of the century, it will reach 100 years. Additionally, as you can see here, the number of older adults is outnumbering the number of children within a couple of decades. This phenomenon is happening mainly because of the post-war generation baby boomers. In 2030, every baby boomers are entering their full retirement age 65. What does it mean for our economy? Due to the baby boomer generation size, over 70 million, They've been a significant force for generating economic growth. So it has been bringing notable impact on US economy as they not only produce less, but also consume and spend less. It also threat the fiscal balance and public health as the demand increases. So for aging populations, Many experts are saying that they should remain in the workforce longer and, and their, um, delay their retirement. I don't think this sounds realistic. The ageism, because how we think about the senior senior citizen and their performance, intentionally or unintentionally, is negative. According to the research, these numbers show that how much ageism is widely spread. The current average retirement age, age is 50, 59 years old. Ageism is one of the underlying causes for many barriers that younger kids and people face. They often viewed as too young or too immature to when it comes to the participation. So ageism is a limiting ability both young and old people and affecting their behavior, their performance and health. Back to this figure, here is a comparison of our education, employment, retirement timeline related to, to past, present, future life expectancy. When the retirement system was introduced in America in 1930s, our life expectancy was only 60. But today, in the future, 
Even if you were luckily rich up to retirement age 65 or 67, the retirement age is no longer suitable as it should be. So this thesis is looking at the ways to live a more fulfilling life as we live longer. By proposing a um, new facility, institutional facility that offers continuing education for all the adults and also exploring an intergenerational environment that people of all age could learn and grow together and ultimately mitigate the ages. So creating a new community that is more inclusive and sustainable that help us to prepare for life transition or embrace sudden life event that we never anticipate. This, this is also look at how the new built environment may look like. Hoping that this type of facility and community spread or grow statewide even more. New facility offers continuing education for all the adults who wants to switch their career and enhance their skill set. Aftercare program for school age kids that is mainly supported by senior staff and community garden, community kitchen as a well-being and also intergenerational contact component. Set selection. The number of young and old adults was the first things I considered. And household size was next consideration. Bethesda, Frederick, Silver Spring, these are the top three cities which has a substantial number of age group, the age groups, and one person household. These are the analysis diagram of three sites related to educational and healthcare institutions and accessibility to mass, trans mass transportations. As you can see here, Things are overlapped. The clusters tell, tell the site candidate from each city. After scoring them by these metrics, Bethesda becomes the most potential site for the thesis. Here you can see the site a little closer. Looking at zoning map of the Desta downtown. This site is situated at the edge of between residential and the commercial zone. Looking at it more closely, the site has, um, is within five minute walk shed from metro station. And it lies on the secondary thoroughfare Arlington Road, where public transportation was served. Here you can see what's surrounding the site. There are two schools, number one and number two spot. Small park with a playground is on the south. And the site contains the library and its parking lot. You can see what building typology are around. Across the road, buildings are higher or denser. And the other size is detached single houses and heavily vegetated for their privacy, privacy issue. The site has two access from Arlington Road and Edgemore Lane. 
the red line indicates the property lines. There are extra space on the nurse's corner. The size of site is approximately 150 by 700 feet long, 190 feet at the widest. The site map shows the um, contour lines at two feet, two foot intervals. It gently slopes to the northwest. And this lot has 25 feet setback, 35 maximum coverage, and 35 height limit. There are wooden fences and wall planters are separating this site from the residential zone and the sign. And you can see in the picture on the right corner, it's taken in 2019 before the pandemic. The parking lot is pretty empty and obviously underused. Design exploration. The, the big idea of the design exploration is inviting people to the site, taking up on the concept of urban invitation by Young Gill. In his book, Cities for People, he emphasized that people interact with their built environment based on the invitation that our environment extend to us. With that in mind, from a person's study, I observed these key spatial strategy for the new facility. Transparency, nature element, and open multipurpose collaboration space. These will enhance the built environment out there and will make user experience richer. So here you're looking at design part T, start with grading to make three public space and position the building in a way to reinforce the urban edge within the fabric. Urban invitation, people's places for people some grading details, and showing the access from the ground level. Cross section and longitudinal section. The eye level of the people in the building and the um, people on the street are the same. Here is an axonometric view of the site. Again, defining urban edge. Split, splitting the mass into two for urban indication. Multi-level public spaces that are corresponding to the topography. Structural grids are driven by the existing context, the library. More green space are added in semi-public level within the building. In the set plan, trees are reinforcing the north-south axis and when defining the public space this way. Bird eye view on the right corner and a longitudinal section that shows the long passes away from public plaza to interstitial space and courtyard and to the street. Set elevation from along the Arlington Road. Here are the plans. 
Main entrance are located on the eastern side and walk through either kitchen or a small library that leads to the shared space. Lecture hall is separated from the main building, but it connects from above level. There are steps that leads to the intercourtyard and this grand staircase leads to the upper level, which has office and seminar rooms, uh, classrooms and roof gardens are on third. These programs are connected by generously spaced circulation and an atrium in the center of the building. Sections, northern building sections, they cut through here. Eastern building section, they cut through here. This shows the um, atrium in the connection to the north, northern part, which, also, which is covered by green wall here. These are the elevation, north elevation showing the portal, and the south elevation, and the um, east elevation along the street. This view is taken from this corner, showing the east and north elevations. This is internal courtyard behind the um, building and can be utilized for outdoor classroom or something else, hanging around, reading newspaper, have some tables, outdoor, outdoor tables and chairs. This view is taken from the um, elementary school field, looking through the portal and the library. Public plaza between the library and community center where anyone could stay or pass through. Community roof garden for intergenerational outdoor activity. Here are some interior views. Community kitchen for cooking class or snack prep for keys. Shared space could be realized for adult uh, earlier in the day and later for keys after school. This third case lead to the um, atrium with the small balconies are picking up. And this space extended to this heap of, of the building, which connects to the northern part. This is how the classroom and hallway may look like. Room for people waiting for next class or so on. So I'd like to conclude this presentation with this famous painting by Rockwell, now quote by Adam Smith. Our societies view the elderly or aging process so negatively. Architecture shaped the way we will live, way we work and think. And the built environment makes a change in our in how we view ourselves and others a lovely being. Thank you. Thank you, Min. And we'll get your uh, board up there and we can open things up now for discussion and conversation here.
Well, um, I'll start uh, once you get while well, you get the board up. Thank you. I think this is a really very successful project. Um, I, I find your renderings to be extremely additive, and they. Um, I appreciated how you talked us through uh, the experiences as you showed us the different renderings. They were very convincing, um, really, really beautifully done. So the the elements that you talked about in the beginning of transparency and nature and collaboration were clearly shown in those renderings, and um, I, I, I. I want to download the whole PDF if possible. I'd love to show my students this. I think it was a really gorgeous project. Your proportions of the building uh, were, it's hard to talk about um, the correctness of proportions, but they were spot on. They just, they really worked really beautifully. Um, and I think the way that you allowed us to uh, generously enter into the exterior spaces, so those, those um, thresholds, were deep and um, really, I think, would encourage that kind of collaboration that you spoke of. So beautiful project. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comment. I'm sorry, I can't see the boards anymore. Yeah, Are maybe, on the no, will you re will you unshare and reshare maybe? We saw it at the beginning, but it, it flipped to black really quickly. Thank you. Do you see everyone's uh, okay. perfect? Thank you. Thank you. No, I also can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. No, no, no. I'm I'm also congratulating you for the clarity of the project and the atmosphere that you are able to give to the building, which is in itself quite uh, rigorous. Uh, so I think you are able to mix this rigor with the softness uh, of, you know, in, the, in, in mostly the interaction of spaces among themselves and uh, the relationship between outdoor areas and indoor areas. I find it, uh, I found the project very, very appealing. Um, he has this sense of, uh, a reassurance uh, for uh, I think especially important for older people, and they you, you don't propose you know the the image of this uh, vernacular uh, cozy cottage like life. Uh, this is clearly an urban site with an urban feeling, but at the same time you're able to recreate the sensation of uh, a. a a soft and uh, a pleasant landscaping. Uh, so you, you you got a good mix between the two conditions. I think uh, the plants are, uh, uh, for what I can see, you know, quickly, uh, they are very well organized in terms of uh, circulation and uh, and the relationship with the windows, fenestrations, uh, and. Uh, uh, in fact, the views that you can have from the building itself. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if uh, maybe the roof scape could be uh, something part of the project more than what I can see here. Uh, like, uh, even if it's like a demonstration that the, uh, the horizontal soil of the city could be employed in many different ways, even uh, just for leisure. I, I think in the lower in the lower uh, rendering here, I see something going on on the roof, just a canopy maybe, uh, but maybe I'm not really able to see it in other sketches or drawings. I think it's a, a, a building of a, a, a clarity of Louis Kahn could be, you know, could be, uh, come, could come to the mind, uh, you know, in the way uh, you organize the building in terms of a rhythm of a, a similar element, but always different at the same time. Uh, so I congratulate for this project. Thank you. Um, yeah, I tried to have 
this space to be to have a sense of home. So when we enter to the building, we pass through either library or a kitchen. We see all the tables like uh, like we are passing through the living room and our home. And while doing the um, while doing developing this project, even though I start from the human scale, I lost the sense of human scale as I developed. And later, my committee member pointed out that I lost the sense through this iterating. And I went back to the first idea, making this space, even though this is an institutional building, still feels like a home. And I forget to how to pronounce um, the all your critics turn or Miss Turner Roth. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm honored to share my PowerPoint or well, whatever you need. Wonderful, and, thank you. You can just drop me up your email address at the chat box. I, I love to share it. Thank you. I agree with all uh, that was said. Uh, I'm very impressed by the clarity and the simplicity of this building. And when I say simple, it's really not uh, easy or simple to achieve. Uh, I love the balance between the solid, the void, um, the interaction between the outside and inside. Every facade is addressing um, the, the space and the connection to the outside. Um, and uh, I, I can see also that um, climate-wise, uh, this building will make a lot of sense. Uh, Light-wise, it would be very pleasant uh, to be there. And um, th there is a balance between uh, unity and variety, uh, between a void and um, solid. It's, it's, I, I can see here that it, it was not easy to, to achieve and it, it's, it turned to be very, very successful. Um, and um, I think it's also the right thing for Bethesda, the right scale. It's not trying to do too much or to just add everything that we know about architecture, but it's just focusing on, on the task and um, and it has its uh, own unmistakable identity. So I, I really like the project. Thank you very much. I, I forget to add a thank you comment in the beginning of my presentation, but from along my three and a half year education in America and UMD from Brian Kelly, Ambrose and Peter Noonan and the Yana Vandergrid, everyone really helped me to. Uh, this is complete. So, yeah, it is really done by uh, teamwork from the beginning to now. So, thank you. So, so I, uh, you know, I echo a lot of the comments that was made. It's a, it's a very, um, it's a good project. It's, it's been pre uh, presented well. I would have liked to have seen more of an interrogation in terms of the multi-generational aspect of it, uh, especially when you consider like, you know, what's the physical or psychological changes of, of, uh, of an aging person, of an elderly person? Uh, how does the architecture kind of negotiate that? Uh, there are ways that you could, I would have like, even if we just take the, let's say the corridor in of itself, right? Where are steps and then where are ramps? Are ramps in and of themselves part of that interrogation? So it becomes more than just a ramp. If, right, <clears throat> excuse me. If that in and of itself gets doubly programmed, if you look at a lot of like OMA projects, it, you know, that happened or look at Russian constructivism and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but along those lines is what I would have been interested in, in kind of seeing, um, because that, I mean, at the, obviously that's the thesis of this project, right, is, is, is that aspect of it. Uh, the presentation was, was well done. Again, the proportions, everything else is, is well done. But I think that interrogation of, you know, how does this project kind of integrate those things, response to the aging, are there 
are there effects that you've taken in, into play? Because your project, probably more so than the others, like spoke to the urban environment really well, right? You spoke about like how does the outside of the autonomy of my, this one particular the site in of itself, how does the the urban environment affect what you're what you're doing? Again, what I don't see is again, you know, how does the elderly, how is this designed for the elderly in mind? Is is I think is this the one is the piece that's missing missing, and, I, and that's a, that's a pretty big piece to be missing again, since that is the thesis of of your project. Right, and that's a good point. And we, I went to the uh, the mobility concern, and I had a ramp iteration. That the ramp was placed where the seating area is currently. But I have. Um, um, previous career work as a social worker for past three years before I enter into this um, this school, and I worked with elderly people for three years very closely, um, evaluating, assess, assess, assessing their health, physical, and every issue they are concerning. They are obviously, I mean, unexpectedly, they are active and they are capable to do more behave activity as we thought. So that was something I got rid of since that, that's one of like our ageism. You know, we think they cannot do this such activity or movement. So that's why the one reason I moved the design decision from ramping to this seating area. I, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to piggyback off Corey a little bit because I, I uh, agree with, with Corey that, um, you know, I think when Corey was mentioning the ramp, for example, he's it's trying to encourage you to think about like different elements of architecture and how those elements can be played with. Like, how do you actually, how is your thesis redefining something architecturally? Um, and, you know, I, I think there are some nice moments in your project where there are uh, different um, programs that um, and adjacencies of different programs that are that are interesting. But for me, I think I also agree that I would have liked to see you be a little bit more polemical um, and a little bit riskier with what could have happened. I, um, you know, for example, I think like ageism in general is obviously a thing. And like, for the most part, the people that are probably the most ageist are the people that are, you know, within their teens to their 30s, 40s, I would say. Um, that's the population that, you know, when older people end up going into homes, those are the people that like won't go visit people in older homes. Um, and so like, it, you know, could the thesis be about a way of, of reintroducing that population to the, to an older generation in an interesting way? And how would the architecture do that and promote that, especially in an urban environment? Um, to me, I think there could have been a little bit more play with, you know, there's the library on site, I think you sort of started with the sort of gesture of a, a stair that leads down to that. But I think that there could have been more, more of an intensive look into the sort of programmatic um, and urban nature of the project that would actually allow, allow you to explore, um, I think allow you to explore the sort of the idea of ageism a little bit more and see how you'd be able to actually combat that through um, the architecture and through program. Thank you for the comments. And honestly, I didn't think of what you're saying along this process. So I really appreciate your comment and Corey too. I think typically in projects like this, in terms of trying to relate uh, it's a nicely developed project, my, my uh, compliments, but in terms of the comments about how you can engage different age groups, um, I think one of the things that, that is important is to understand which spaces in a building like this are shared and which spaces are particularly dedicated to a particular group. So, you know, the, the kind of buildings that I've done like this there's like a teen program and they own that and they go there. 
and then and there's a senior program and there are parts of the building that the seniors use and just they use and what tends what's interesting about that is that the different age groups tend not to use the building at the same hours of the day i mean they have different patterns through the day of you know when they use things and stuff like that so i think what that does is it sort of puts a sort of pressure on well, what are the communal spaces that happen in a kind of not on a quotidian basis, but maybe on every so often there are events like book sales or other things that happen that are programmatically happen. And where are the shared spaces where people from different kinds of demographics can come and, and, and be part of that community and, and participate in something like that. So it would almost be like, You'd want to shape things, the exterior spaces and some of the program things to certain kinds of events that might be specific to Bethesda or even think about the kinds of events that people would participate in that have that kind of broader reach in the community. All right, I placed the public programs on the ground level. As you can see on the level one plan, the shared space is on the ground level and as well as a small library and the lecture hall and the kitchen. So it's pretty much open to anyone. And I believe so they are overlapping hours, even though like all, all the older all people and younger people, even though they came in different time zones, they still have overlap hours and Still, we can, yeah, we can have a small event for this small community. Yeah, and the other thing that happens in communities like this is that oftentimes, you know, public agencies that sponsor these kinds of things, they have a kind of generic program or a program that they use in a lot of different places. And what they say to the architects is, and I think it's something you've picked up on is, but how do you customize it for this community? You know, how do you understand what this community wants what this community is all about and what aspects of the architecture make it a kind of more place specific kind of design so that it, even though it has elements that could be in other communities, it's something that people recognize as uniquely part of Bethesda. You know. Very, very beautiful drawings, by the way, particularly the perspective drawings, which I think are nice and full of light and they seem like places where people would want to linger and be part of community activities right now. Yeah, I agree. I think the the aesthetic that you give in these in these perspectival views, uh, this is something that uh, Chris Morrison's made a comment in the chat. I, I think it so challenges the the common aesthetic that we get in the United States for senior uh, facilities. That that itself, the the aesthetic proclamation, I think here. That this isn't this isn't a traditional solution. That you're you're creating places that everyone in the community will want to come and spend time, and it'll be a place that people want to linger. I mean, I think there's just something really wonderful. Your sense of proportion, the openness, uh, the transparency that you've given to many of these places, the way it relates to the outdoor spaces, I think is really beautifully done. I think your presentation was very very clear and and, and concise. Uh, to me, that aesthetic issue is not something to be under underplayed. I agree with some of the mobility comments. Uh, you know, I think there's there are other elements that could be layered into this, but to me, that aesthetic uh, distinction, right, trying to set this apart from the normative condition, is, is really something quite commendable. And to me, it would be the most transformative aspect in reframing aging, right? reframing aging in everyone's perceptions. I think the comment that was made about people not wanting to go and be involved in in uh, visiting people in aging facilities or participating in some of those things because of the psychological connotations of aging, our, every one of us dealing with our own mortality. There's something really wonderful about these places that I think it, it will overwhelm those tendencies and it will get people to really reframe and reposition their connection to the aging community. So my compliments to you for a really wonderful project and beautiful representation here. Thank you very much.
Still an opportunity for more comments out there. So this time I'm <laughs> I'm not yeah. raising hand. I just jump in. <laughs> first yeah, first time. Um, uh, this is really really beautiful presentation, and I agree with all the comments about the um, the styles and the uh, perspectives and color schemes. Very soft and well developed and. It's very inviting and it's um, it's beautiful and your diagram is um, really cute and it kind of conveys the idea how the progressions. Um, it reminded me of and someone just comment about the um, the specific um, to the um, the aging um, about the mobilities and um, accommodations and such. Um, I had a brief experience um, working with the um, the Gallaudet University at the developing of their new um, the um, dormitory, um, and I got a hands on the um, deaf um, space principle design principle. Um, what I realized is that it is not too different than what you would feel comfortable or more intuitive in applying some of those principles into the built environment. It is more of the recognizing different abilities and different way of recognizing and you know, the, um, placing yourself um, in different sensory abilities. I think it can be a similar way that it doesn't really need to scream out that this is aiding certain type of um, the mobilities or things like that, however, you know, things like the um, generous um, size of the corridors and, you know, like uh, having, you know, pulling out the corridor and then providing a seats and the uh, light kind of filters through. Um, those kind of the small gestures or um, the ideas that is universal to every different, different level of able body can enjoy and adapt. I think those are something that can be, um, recognize in this, um, in your development. And I think it was quite um, striking that if you didn't mention, if, you, if somebody didn't ask you a question about mobility and you didn't mention about your previous experience with carrying um, the senior group, um, I wouldn't have known. But at the same time, I think those are the elements that make your um, design more intuitively um, feeling comfortable and very adaptable. So I think, you know, if you could have um, forthcoming and applying those into more of your um, the presentation, that could have been um, um, very fulfilling and self-explanatory. But I, overall, this is beautiful. And this place is some, somewhere I would love to visit um, and, you know, um, grow old in this. So congratulations for your achievement. Thank you. Yeah, honestly, I was in hesitation. I was hesitating whether I include my personal experience within this presentation. But yeah, I end up doing, you know, not included um, to meet the time frame. Yeah, the all the people, like the people I met in previous place, uh, workplace. A lot of majority of them, even though we recommend them to have cane and walker every day on daily basis for safety issue, they they don't want to carry those things on daily basis. Thus, they don't want they look older from you know people, uh, parent, I mean, family around him or under them. So that's the things they don't want to look norm as we are. But you know, your, your experience, you know, beyond being an architect and, and life experiences are sometimes what clients pay for and that's to your advantage and that's the value you bring to the project. That's, you know, again, why diversity is so important, you know, different, different viewpoints, different perspectives. So, um, you know, embrace that. When, when you have certain types of projects. We, we all come with um, uh, our own histories. And um, so I, I think that's great that you picked this as a subject. Obviously it's a passion of yours 
and you have something special to say about it. Uh, very elegant project. Thank you, Michael. And one, one more thing I forget to include with the presentation was that it's not only just for um, all the generation just to be there, and there are tremendous, tremendous uh, experiential wisdom and all things I've learned from previous generation and older generation that's really valuable. I want this type of space will still value this experiential knowledge and we can still, we don't lose the togetherness, the benefit of the togetherness and pass down to the next generation. This type of space could be a resource for you know, future. Without experience, without, without experiencing this type of experience, we don't really know. We can teach this type of experiential knowledge at school without looking, without engaging, without like face to face touch, without contact. We, we can learn this type of things and what's called soft skill. Great work. Thank you, Min. I'd like to introduce now Peter Noonan, professor of the practice who was chair of this committee. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you, Min, and all of the reviewers. Um, I thought your project um, supported a great conversation here. The, the last hour was just wonderful to hear you present the work and then get a response from this collection of uh, wonderful people. And just to pick up on a few of those threads, I think Michael's uh, comments about, you know, life experience and diversity of viewpoints and, and carrying our own histories into our projects and work is so important. And oftentimes that is what makes or, or breaks a project. Um, and then um, Mike Ambrose's and Chris's comments and, and together with Matt's, this idea about kind of addressing the programming. I think the project does, um, does that successfully at the urban scale in linking the, the, your project to the library. And I think the comments are well taken at the scale, I, I would say the building in the room. Um, and then, I guess finally, I, I'd like to pick up on some of the words that were used at the beginning of the responses. Um, generosity, rigor, clarity. Uh, those words are, are words that I think describe the project, but they also describe men and men's process. And so uh, congratulations, and uh, we're looking forward to what you do in the future. Thank you very much. Congratulations, men. And I, as we're closing here for the first session, I would like to thank our reviewers, Michael Ambrose from Raleigh, North Carolina, Fariz Giga from DSNR Architects in New York, Corey Henry, our key distinguished professor this semester, Sunhee Kim, uh, architect with Design Collective in Baltimore, My, Michael Marshall, just around the corner here uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, of Michael Marshall Designs. Chris Morrison, also of uh, uh, in Washington with Perkins and Will. Franco Pisani over there in Florence, Italy. Please be safe, Franco. Uh, um, uh, Andrea Ponzi, just down the block in, in Florence, Italy. It's great to see you. Thank you for your time this afternoon, this evening for you guys. Suzanne Reitig across town at Suzanne Reitig Architects here in Washington, D.C. And Tolia Stonerov, guess what? It's snowing here and it's not snowing in Vermont. What's going on with this world? It's turned upside down. We'll see you all at about 2.45 this afternoon. Some of you we will not see. Thank you for your service here today. Uh, it's been a great morning and thank you all for being here. Go 